Hey everybody, my name is Timur. Uh, I work at Roli in London and I work in the Juice team. Um, and uh, this is a talk, uh, this is the third in a series of talks that I, um, so the first uh, one in this series I gave at CBPCon last year, which was like an overview of how C C++ works in the audio industry or for typical audio applications. Then um, there was a second episode about um, basically atomics and lock free and how to use that in an audio context uh, at the Juice Summit last year, which is our, our own conference. Um, just a little bit of background about me. So um, I work, um, I'm on a Juice team. So Juice is a framework. Juice is an application framework. It's cross-platform, so it works on um, Windows, Mac, Linux, um, Android, and iOS. And it provides you with graphics, GUI widgets, network, cryptography. We have a very nice string class as well. Um, so everything you would need to build an app. And also uh, we have the complete audio stack abstracted away. So um, it's very popular for um, audio applications. Actually hundreds of um, so audio software companies use Juice to build their apps. And we also have a build system which um, basically supports um, Visual Studio down to 2008, Xcode, make Android Studio and various other Android based uh, build systems and it has also a live coding engine which um, Jules actually presented here a couple of uh, years ago. So um, yeah this is sort of the the background and um, here are just a few examples of what people do with um, this framework. So that's Traction which is actually written by Jules which is a um, uh, software for music production. This, here's Max which is a software like a modular um, sort of system visual programming language to create everything from musical instruments to video installations to whatever generative um, creative tools. Uh, this is for example Noise. This is an iPhone app that we uh, make at Roly uh, which lets you play keyboard using the, the force touch on the screen. So this is just uh, you know a little bit about um, you know what we or and other people do with Juice. Um, so basically the sort of the, the audio world as I would sort of describe it, like the, the basics of uh, a typical audio application is that you have all these different threads. So you have maybe someone playing a keyboard, you have maybe some audio files being written and read, you have a GUI that the user can tweak, and then you have this, um, you have this audio thread. So the um, sound card um, actually gives you a callback. Uh, and this happens in real time. And this is sort of the um, specific thing about audio. And this is a real-time thread that um, shouldn't block. And um, basically, this real-time audio callback works like this. You don't call the audio card. The audio card calls you. And then it gives you a pointer where you have maybe a millisecond to write some audio data that will be then uh, transmitted through the speakers, for example. And um, there, you're going you're gonna to do some uh, DSP. Is that? Oh, that's not working here. Okay, maybe I can use my mouse mouse cursor. Yeah. So so basically, it's, uh, you're gonna crunch some floats here, uh, which is how audio is typically represented in this kind of context, and this should be as fast as possible. So and this is also real time. So we have strong strong real time uh, boundaries on you know. Um, so this is sort of why we care about performance in the audio industry. And uh, basically, the first the first um, talk in the series was um, CBPCon one, where I sort of go in depth about like all the consequences of this and the typical sort of programming patterns that you would use. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, go ahead. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. Um, but yeah, in the end, we care about performance, just like you do. Um, and it's the same thing as usually like about. 10 or 20 percent of the code is going to take 80 or 90 percent of the computational time. Um, now um, we've seen a great talk by um, Jason about a lot of stuff that um, affects performance. I really like that talk. Um, but I think um, this performance stuff falls into sort of two categories. Um, so the first category is the language C++. Um, you know there's a lot of books about it like Myers, there's a lot of more you know, books more specific about performance, maybe. Um, and this seems to me like, like a lot of, you know, the things that, um, about performance here, um, you can sort of derive from the language in a way. So for example, um, you know, if you, if you read Myers, then you learn that, you know, 
moving a vector is probably better than copying a vector, so you know that's what you do. Or for example, um, when I first heard about std function, I wanted to know, oh wow, this is so cool. How is this implemented? So I, I went in there and I tried to figure out how it works, and then there's this whole uh, type erasure thing in there, so you need like a polymorphic object inside, and for that you need heap allocation. So yeah, sort of it, from what it does, you can sort of derive that this will this will probably um, have a performance cost. Um, and so this is sort of one, one aspect. And then there's the second category of performance things, which is the hardware. And um, I find this much harder because knowing C++ very well doesn't really help. And um, you know, C++ books also don't talk much about it. And the standard doesn't really talk much about it. And um, it seems always to me that there's like a lot of secret knowledge that you sort of stumble upon at some point. And you know, obviously, like computer science teaches a lot about how computers work, but um, they don't do C++. So this is not. So they don't show, for example, C++ code in there. Um, so um, you know, I find I find this a bit harder. So um, basically, I took this this talk as an opportunity to sort of um, you know uh, meditate a little bit about all the different ways how hardware affects performance, and. Um, I think we have a, I have a later we have a talk about the cache where um, um, we will have like an in-depth explanation of how the cache works. So I'm really really looking forward to that talk, and maybe you can see this one as a sort of like intro, uh, where I sort of go through a few aspects and you know share a few thoughts. Um, so as uh, I was originally preparing this talk, um, it's sort of what I originally wanted to say sort of fell apart a little bit. So basically this is, um, I picked up the pieces and I put together uh, some other talk, um, which is about the same topic, but maybe the structure is a little bit different. So uh, I'm going to talk about various effects, which is um, cache locality, memory alignment, cache associativity. Uh, then there is you know, vectorization and ZIMD, which is for audio, a very, very important topic. And then memory alignment is related to all these topics. And then um, you also have branch prediction, which plays a role in performance. And then you have denormals. Uh, and these are all um, sort of things that don't come from the language, but they come from how the hardware works. And um, so the, the, the way I sort of ended up structuring this is um, sort of going through these different aspects and um, doing micro benchmarks. And we already heard in uh, the other talk that micro benchmarks are difficult to do without confirming what you actually want to see. So because if you do a micro benchmark, uh, typically um, you know the code around it affects what you're trying to measure in very non-obvious ways. And there's the optimizer that also breaks what you probably want to show. And um, then you don't measure what you think. But here, for the purpose of this talk, I don't say that it's rigorous. So I don't, I don't want to like really precisely measure like a particular aspect of a particular application. So it's, it's more for demonstration purposes. Um, because I think, um, you know, in order to, to, to get a better feel for how these um, different, different aspects of hardware and performance behave, uh, it's, 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 always, it's always nice to, um, you know, it's, it may feel a bit naive, but it's still valuable just to, you know, come up with some code that demonstrates a particular aspect and you know, measure it just to get a feeling of how it behaves. And basically, it's good to get a feeling of the worst case and to help like, get a mental model of what's going on. And then with that knowledge, you, you can go to your real code and measure it. And of course, if you measure your code, you should always do whatever, whatever thing you know, your measurement says you should do. Um, but um, you know, then at least you, know, there's a, you have an overview of all the things that you know, could affect your performance and maybe um, it helps with some decisions. You know, should I spend some time on you know this thing or maybe not? Um, so I have a few sort of very simple micro benchmarks that I'm going to go through, and um, I, uh, I've used these devices, which are basically the devices I, I have with me here. So it's uh, the MacBook that I'm running the presentation on. It's a fairly recent i7 Intel model. Then I have a older Intel PC which is running a Core 2 Duo, and then I have the most recent iPhone, which is the one in my pocket, and then an Android phone that I borrowed from work. Uh, and basically, this is sort of like a range of devices that um, is interesting for us, because this is basically what Ju Juice also runs on. And I also used all the 
like these three compilers like Clang, GCC and Visual Studio, the newest ones, which are basically the three compilers that we use for, for juice development. So um, yeah, let's start with cache locality. Um, so uh, basically the, the hello world of cache locality, which I'm sure you all um, have encountered, just as an introduction, is um, you know, this 2D array traversal. So you can, you can go through the 2D array either in row major order or in column major order. And this is the order in which the memory is actually contiguously stored, and this is the wrong order. Um, so here you would be jumping instead of going contiguously. And um, you know, this is in a way also similar to this other thing that is the other typical example, which is the list, where you would also be jumping from place to place. Um, although actually, to be fair to the list, I have to say that if you newly allocate a list and just put some fresh items in it, it will more look like this. So they are actually more or less contiguous. But anyway, let's just do the simple first example, like very, very primitive benchmark, um, where I just literally just allocate it to the array and then loop through it in row major order and in column major order. Um, and just do like a simple float addition, no, actually integer addition. Um, so um, let's say the array is like 30 megabytes, like a typical big resolution image or something. How, how much would you estimate, like the wrong version, the second one is slower than the, the first one? Is it 10 times, is it 1,000 times? What do you think? 100. 100. Who thinks it's more than 100? Uh, on this machine, I should say. Um, okay, who thinks it's less than 100? Less than 10. All right. So yeah, you're, you have the right feeling for that. Um, it's about 30 or 40 on this machine. And um, the first time I encountered this, um, I was a physics um, student. And I was uh, coding in, in Fortran, where actually it's the other way around. Like the column major order is the right one. And sort of I had this, this mental model of a computer where you have a CPU, registers, memory, you have data. And I had a big book about Fortran, uh, and everything that the book, the book basically, this is how I, where I learned programming. And the book sort of suggested that this is the model. And then my supervisor came to me and said, yeah, you should watch out for this thing. Um, and you know, the reason, the reason why, um, why it's slower is because, uh, you know, um, the, it's more expensive for the CPU to jump than to go contiguously, which is very, very much true, right? So um, definitely the thing that computers are best at is going through memory contiguously. Um, uh, but now, um, actually, if you do the same benchmark and you vary the size, then um, I'm sure many talks about this topic also show this, this picture you have sort of, so the wrong one is the upper one and um, like higher is longer. Uh, you have a sort of step-like step curve where sort of as long as the area fits into L2 cache, it's sort of the same. Then it, when you get L2 cache misses, it jumps very quickly and then it it's sort of flat again when it fits in the next level, like L3 cache, and then it goes up again if you get um, cache misses in that level. And, and here's this, this factor 40 again. So this leads to this uh, you know, better model where you have all these, these different levels, and basically each level have, has about an order of magnitude more storage. Uh, but then also the latency is also about an order of magnitude um, longer. And basically, uh, you, it's like you can very efficiently um, you know, transmit data between all these levels, but the thing that gets much slower as you go up is, you know, fed, like starting to read data from somewhere. Uh, and then also, yeah, the data comes in cache lines. Um, so this is, you know, this is very simple, but now make, let's make it a little bit more interesting. And um, let's um, take the same code, but let's make the array do a little bit of work. Um, so here it's the same, it's the same um, benchmark, instead that now I use a float, and then I let it compute uh, like a multiplication, like a hash value, and then a square root. It's, it's very silly, but you know, it's, it's this kind of sort of computation that you would maybe get in the realistic code. And then what you see is that uh, it looks like this. So um, here um, at this end you have a factor two. And then at the lower end actually um, you don't see a difference anymore. And at this point, sort of, there was like a certain critical size, and, and to the right of the size, your application is bound by the memory access. And to the other side of it's the application is bound by, you know, your computation. 
And uh, if, you, if you compare it to the, to the first one, which is not doing anything besides the traversal, then you see that on the right side, actually, it, it, it doesn't even matter that you're computing something. It's the, same, it's the same speed because it's bound by the cost of the memory access. And um, yeah, I mean, this, uh, this is exactly what you, what you don't want. So um, typically, you want to be bound by um, either you know, the algorith algorithmic complexity of the algorithm that computes your results that you, wa you want to have, or the throughput of the data that you want to send somewhere, but not the memory access. So if, you, if you're on the right side of this graph, then you have a problem. Now, the actual problem is that um, if, if, I don't know, if people um, think they have a performance problem, what they do is they profile, right? Which is, which is a good thing. Now, let's, let's profile this. Now, if you profile it, for example, I use Xcode. Typically, people use the time profiler, which tells you uh, how much time you spend on each function. You know, this is what everyone's doing. And if you do that, you see, you know, for this simple benchmark, you see this simple uh, output where it says, uh, like, basically 13.9%. So you spend 100% in main, obviously, and then 13.9% in square root with this very nice um, re return type there. Um, and then you may think, OK, well, wh wh where's the rest? And then um, if you look at the code again, I mean, OK, the multiplication and addition is probably not very much. So the other thing is the hash. That's probably in a header. Um, so that's probably inline. So this is why it doesn't appear there. So um, you know, um, this is probably the hash. So you go. You go away for a week and you optimize your hash function. Yeah, and then you come back and you see uh, it's still the same, right? And this is what it means to be bound by by your memory access. And uh, the, the the problem is that the, the pro time profile is not telling you. And um, I mean, even if you you sort of want to look for that, for example, in Xcode, there is very very well hidden somewhere there was like a counter where you can measure different CPU things, and one of them is cache misses. So there's like a cache miss counter buried s deep within like these instrument uh, tools. So you can do that, and then you get like a number like, OK, I have 1,300,000 cache misses per second. OK, and this is, this is also not really telling you much, right? So is that a lot? Is that, you, do, you don't know, right? So um, yeah, it's, I think it's very, very difficult to, um, to sort of handle the, or the, correctly profile this kind of this kind of problem. So in this case is it's cash cash coherency, yeah? So um, maybe for this particular problem where where you have an error and you want to assign you know something to every element, the most efficient way is to go contiguously like this, row major. Uh, maybe if you have a if you have another problem, like I don't know, it's an image and you want to draw like a, a blob somewhere on that image, yeah, then maybe um, you know the ideal the ideal way to to arrange this data structure would be something like this, where you have like tiles, um, and you know the the ideal tile size would depend on you know your typical blob and also probably your hardware, right? And then um, I don't know for another problem maybe um, the the ideal data structure would look something like this, and you don't even need the ideal data structure. You you need a data structure that's good enough so that you're not bound by memory access into that data structure. And um, you, know, you, can, you can do the same thing with time. It works in all dimensions. So if you have like, you know, the, the green data, and then you access some other rata, data, which is the red one, and then at some point you access the green data again, then the different points where you access the green data, you want them to be not only, basically, you want the data to only be close in space, but you also want the, them to be close together in time, because this is also going to be more cache efficient. And this works with a lot of different dimensions. And it's like sort of always the same thing. Like, for example, if you have, um, I don't know, two different classes here, foo and bar, and then you, you end up with this, you, you happen to have this situation where, you know, you have a vector of, of structs of the one type and, the, the, you know, a vector of the structs of the other type. And, and for some reason, you always, like one of the foos always belongs to one of the bars and you need to do something with them then this is also very inefficient. And probably the better idea is to put them together in a class and then access them there so that they're next to each other. And it's the same thing over again. So basically, it's like the 2D area, except the second dimension is here 
the, the different classes. Yeah. And um, so this is data access, but then it's the same thing with executing code, like access to code. And uh, I don't know, it's like, this is a very fun sort of like, a bit silly example. But um, imagine sort of you have a big, you have a big binary, you have many functions, yeah? So let's say we have a uh, hundred thousand different functions which all do something different, yeah, like this. And then here's actually we can actually gen generate this code, yeah. This is, um, and then we we compile this, yeah. We generate this code. We compile this into so we get a five megabyte CPP file. We compile this into a about fifteen megabyte executable, uh, not executable, like a binary file with all these 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 functions in there, which is you know fifteen megabyte object file. You know, people use bigger object files. That, uh, so that's about the same size as the, you know, the array, the image, where you had the factor of 40 if you traverse it in the wrong direction. Except now these are functions. Uh, and then, you know, you have an app and that links to that object file and calls these functions, maybe in some weird order. And then, you know, this is very, very similar to traversing the array. Uh, and you're gonna, so, sort of the numbers are uh, sort of similar. And um, maybe it's going to be like more like traversing, you know, the array in the wrong direction, or maybe depending on the structure of your program, calling these functions will be more like traversing a tree, or maybe if the functions all call each other, then it's it's going to be more like traversing a linked list. But um, it's going to be very similar to like uh, accessing like one of these non-local data structures. So. Just executing this code will, will also slow you down because you will have the same problem. You're bound by the data access, but this, this time to the instructions that you want to execute. So it's, it's, it's always the same problem of the 2D array all, all over again. Um, so yeah. Would it, a, a, a way to address that be to play around the linker to put your function all together so at least you get some continuity? Or is that hmm. Well, you have the cache, right? So um, we learned um, we learned yesterday from David that Intel will only execute code that's in the instruction cache. So um, you know you don't know where your your functions are in the object file, but as soon as you execute them once, they're they're in the instruction cache. So you just want to uh, make sure that they're sort of local, that they, they stay in the cache like that. You, you 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 sort of the structure of your program, like what functions are called, sort of in what order, is is is, is, is cache friendly. So in a way that you know, you don't access, you don't have a function which is like super important, like performance critical, but you, you, you call it like very irregularly and then each time you, you would fet fetch it into the cache and that cache and you would have this latency. Yeah. So then, but, okay, so then how do you handle the challenge of, in an ideal world, you have your entire data set to work on and you call function, like mm. a single function on your entire data set. Mm. Mm. But how do you do with the fact that you don't have your entire data set at once? You only have a little bit of your data set at a time. For, you, know, you, you don't process all your audio at once, you just do a little bit at a time. But, but these are different things, right? It's like the part, like the data cache and the instruction cache, they're independent. Right, but you have to call your function, like let's say on your entire data. Mm -hmm. If I had all my data at once, I would call my function across all of it. Oh. Yeah. I don't have data. I don't have a large data that, That's a very interesting thing that I, I just didn't have the time to do, but yeah. Um, basically benchmark if you have like, as typical in audio, you have like a processing function and then you have some sort of buffer size. Sort of like where the compromise is between the ideal buffer size and sort of the, the function call overhead, yeah? Because if you have a very small buffer, you have to call the function all, like many, many, many times. But then uh, on the other hand, if you have a big buffer, then you have you have more latency, but then you have less function function overhead. So where the sort of ideal balance is, this would be, yeah, I, I, did, I didn't really measure that. I think it also highly depends on your code. So that's definitely s worth investigating a bit more. Actually, actually a very good idea. Um, okay, so memory alignment. Um, I think I'm gonna um, skip, skip a little bit here because I actually have, I think, too many slides. Um, so basically, um, memory is like a, a, a lined and a, yeah. So 
you have you have different alignment requirements. Um, basically, for the fundamental types, um, the alignment requirement is, is the size, and typically the way memory works is that you just it's not like that, but you, you just wouldn't find you would find an in ideally in, in, in a word and you wouldn't find it in, 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 in between so it would be aligned and um, if you if you have a struct then the compiler does it for you and then sort of all the all the members are aligned to their alignment requirements uh, which leads to the effect that you know if you change the order your the size of your class may change and then um, a thing that um, you, s you see in audio code quite a lot is um, these packed structures, and um, this is the, uh, the Clang way of saying it. There is a Visual Studio thing where you say pragma pack, I think pragma, pragma pack. Uh, there's unfortunately no um, standard way of saying this. This is basically saying ignore the alignment, just pack, pack the struct. And I don't know why we have, for example, bit fields in C++, but not this. I'm not sure, uh, but, um, but it's very useful, for example, um, it's traditionally used for things like if you have an um, audio file which just has a particular binary format, for example, and you want to have a structure that um, just has the same binary format um, in, in the structure of the struct. Or for example, embedded people use that if they want to have a structure that maps onto hardware registers, or, you know. Um, and um, for example, here you have like 10 chars in the fourth, in the fourth um, line, which means that all the ints below will be will be unaligned, misaligned. And um, someone, someone explained to me that, um, yeah, well, this is a very important factor. Um, you know, if you have unaligned memory access, then each time, uh, basically, because you only can fetch data in, in words, you, you can sort of like have to take the first half, take the second half, shift them, and then combine them, and then you have your float. And then someone else said, oh, well, no, actually that, you know, that was like that maybe 10 years ago, but on modern computers, you know, it doesn't matter. So I just, I just wanted to quickly check, you know, who's right and just, you know, measure that um, with on, on these devices. So I have um, basically the same structure, packed and not packed. And I just came up with this little benchmark, uh, which is actually not that easy because there is another guy on the internet who did something similar, but he computes a hash in there. So probably that's, uh, going to, you know, take take more time, and then um, you need to. If you have so, so basically, what I'm doing is I have an array of these structs, and then um, basically in one version, each each um, dou double will be aligned, and the other version it will be like seven out of eight will be misaligned, and then I just have another vector of floats, and I'm just gonna basically copy copy them in there, and every one every every one of them will be an unaligned memory access. So, so yeah, I have to watch out for the size that it fits into the cache. Otherwise, I'm going to be bound by the memory again. Um, I'm going to make. I have to make sure that um, basically the data is in the cache uh, before before the timer starts. And um, yeah, if I do that, it turns out that um, you now on the older Intel, uh, this has a, a impact, big impact, and on on the ARM devices as well. So it's about, it's about three times more expensive to read and write unaligned memory, which is sort of like what you would expect. Yeah, you, you need like a shift and a combine. Um, and then on the modern uh, Intel i7, it's actually faster to read and write unaligned data because the, the I guess because the structure itself is also a bit smaller. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, this structure is smaller by, what, 7 divided by 16? It's like uh, maybe 40-something percent. So, um, yeah, maybe that makes, that makes it smaller. So, and, and this is interesting because this means basically maybe I should just take my, um, you know, audio app um, if I want to have it run on this computer very well and just sprinkle everything with um, pa Pragma Packed and then it's going to be faster. Who knows? But, like, I would never have thought about that. But maybe this is going to, if, if everything's packed and that's like for free on, on, on this machine, maybe this is going to improve my cache locality. Who knows? So, um, let's see. I think I'm going to. Hmm? I'm curious actually, though, uh, if you go back, um, mm -hmm. what if you had a single term and a whole lot of them, like an array of them? 
Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I tried that as well, and the effect was was smaller than, than this. And I think this is because um, probably the optimizer is doing some fancy. Oh, sorry. The question was um, the question was if I just um, offset all of the doubles by the same amount, basically, instead of packed like this, right? Oh, if I didn't have the char sprinkled throughout. Oh, I didn't. I didn't try that. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's some, something interesting to try. I mean, I have all the code here, so we can actually do it later if you're interested. Um, let's see how much time I have. Mm. So um, there's, a, there's another way to generate a, uh, underlying memory access is that if you um, cast between types that have, um, basically you have like a, for example, like a char, and then you just cast it into a double. Um, so that's also probably going to create an unaligned memory access because the alignment agreement of this is one because it just contains chars. And um, I tried this as well. It's like an very, very similar to the other case, except that I don't have a member, but I just reinterpret, like I just say, you know, take the structure and reinterpret the bytes as a double. And I saw that on the Intel machines and on the iPhone, it was more or less the same. It was pretty much exactly actually the same, the same effect. But on the Android phone, this happened. It crashed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, I looked a bit into the documentation, and it said, yeah, on some ARM processors, actually, they don't support this kind of unaligned memory ac uh, access um, because, um, you know, if you if you have the other case where you tell the compiler that this double is going to be misaligned, then it's going to create these special instructions. But if you just pass it a pointer at runtime, it just doesn't know what to do with it. And then if it's, that's misaligned, then the CPU is going to throw, throw like an interrupt or uh, whatever it's called, and then Android as an operating system doesn't, you know, or this particular version doesn't catch that, and then it just crashes. And, and this actually happened in Juice where we had you know, code that was reading some audio format which was working for 10 years, and then we implemented Android support, and then the app started crashing. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, basically, the, um, the standard compliant way of, of doing that is to have a union. Um, because um, that's sort of like the portable way of, of taking one type and just interpreting it as another <laughs> type. Because the alignment requirement of that is going to be the same as the double. And um, yeah, so I, I actually compared this with the reinterpret cast. I wrote a benchmark. It's exactly the same speed. So um, over alignment. Let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, in audio especially, and I think in other parts of C++ as well, sometimes you want to align a, a type uh, to like an over alignment, not what, what it's like eight or whatever if it's double, but uh, more than, yeah, sorry? So just to clarify that, that last thing, it's still not defined behavior. That's not defined behavior? Uh, because of uh, strict aliasing violations, or? It's because of active member of the Yeah, I know the access will be active member of the union. Ah, that's interesting the because. Is, like, the only correct way is to use memcopy. Yeah, but memcopy has an overhead. Uh, no, it's my, it's, uh, yeah, no. Oh. Will make it well, that's interesting because we, we actually have, in Juice, we have this kind of stuff there where. Um, you know, the interpret cast would just, you know, create nonsense on some compilers, but then the union works. But, yeah. yeah. Because, uh, like, all compilers actually support this mm. explicitly, but it is not standard compliant. Yeah. Um, oh, I forgot to re repeat the, so the, the comment was that the union is also not defined behavior, um, and you should use memcopy and some, some compilers uh, optimize that away. So, yeah, cool. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the comment. Um, so um, let's see. Um, so over alignment. So uh, there's there's a number of reasons why you would uh, like to align your object to a certain alignment. For example, if you want to use SIMD, we're going to talk about that later. If you want to align along cache lines, we're going to talk about later as well. And um, 
in C++ 98, it used to be some compiler intrinsics which were different on Clang and Visual Studio and so on. Uh, but then in C++ 11, we have aligners. And this is really great because you cannot put only a number there. You can put a type in there. You can put a, put a list of things in there. You can put a const expert in there. You can, and if it's too small, the number that you uh, supply there, then you're actually going to get a compiler error. So, so it's, it's really great. Um, and that's really useful. But um, in real-time programming, for example, what you, you most of the time what you want to do is um, you want to you want to allocate a, a buffer like on the heap because um, you are in this real-time thread and you probably want some buffers to write temporary data into. But on a real-time thread, you can't allocate or deallocate anything because that's not a real-time safe operation that may have like a lock in there. Um, so what you typically do is you, you pre-allocate buffers from another thread uh, on the heap, and then you want them to be aligned. And uh, then you're going to use them from the real-time thread. So, so yeah, we, for example, we, we knew this, this buffer, and then we want to make this align. And uh, this is um, just allow me just to go through this um, to, to um, you know, demonstrate how frustrating working with C++ and you know, the hardware can, can sometimes be. So, um, so what new, so, so new, okay. What, how does, how is new, what does new actually return? Like, um, so what, what kind of memory location does new return if you just call new? And then um, uh, CPPREF says that um, there's this max align T, right? Which is um, the, the maximum alignment of, um, you know, the, 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 the maximum alignment of all the fundamental types. So if you have a pointer that's al like aligned, and this is going to be 16 on typically on, on, on most computers, or uh, eight maybe on other systems. So it says, it says here that um, pointers returned by allocation functions such as malloc are suitably aligned for any object, which means are aligned at least as strict as, as max aligned T. It would be great because max aligned T on, a, on, for example, on a Intel is 16, and 16 is just the alignment you need for SSE, for example. So you wouldn't even need to worry about that. That would be really nice. Uh, but then allocations functions such as malloc, and I tried to find it in the standard whether new is one of these allocation functions that obey this rule, and the standard wouldn't say anything about that, uh, or at least I didn't find it. So, so I tried it. Um, it's allocated char uh, on this Mac. You have a char on the heap. Uh, let's allocate another char. Fine. It's, there's 16, 16 bytes in between. We get, we're great. It's max align T. Let's allocate another one. There's going to be another gap of 16. Awesome. Let's try this on the, on the, on the older core to do. Allocate one char, allocate another char, allocate another char. Great. It's, it's, it's using um, all of them are 16 bytes aligned. Fine. Let's try it on the iPhone. Uh, we allocate one char. We allocate another char. Oh, okay, well, that's actually fine because max line T on, an, uh, on, on this ARM processor is eight. So it, it still makes sense. Let's allocate the third one. Okay, fine. Now let's, let's take the other phone. Let's take the, the, the um, Snapdragon ARM phone, which is the, the Nexus 5X. Let's allocate one char, another char. Oh, well, okay, that, that didn't work. <laughs> hmm, okay. Then maybe just the, the, this computer is just too nice to us, but there's apparently no such rule. Or maybe, I mean, the standard doesn't say if it, how it should behave, or at least I didn't, yeah? There's yeah, a so the behavior of a new char or allocated char has uh, a different rule. Ah, that OK. Is, uh, it has to allocate enough space, like, uh, I don't remember the exact rate, but it basically, uh, it has that, uh, well, for new char, right? I don't know if this one could be different, but new char array, it is it has to have an alignment for the uh, highest alignment of a type of that size. Okay, so the comment was that um, new char or char array has special behavior where it would have the right alignment for a type of that size and not necessarily for every type. Right? Yeah, yeah. Any type of that can fit in that size, the highest mm. alignment. Ah, okay. Because from malloc, from malloc, it says it should always be max aligned T. Yeah, from malloc, for char array. 
Yeah. Okay. But it's also di is it is it also different for malloc char? Oh no, you don't do that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Okay. Let's let's try to convince this phone to align our memory. So let's instead of a char, let's 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 put the structure on it and tell it it should be aligned with eight bytes. Yeah, and then just allocate one of those, and then another one. <laughs> nope, that doesn't work. So so okay, let's 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 take an array of these things. Surely, like if you have an array of a thousand foos and you say they should be aligned by eight bytes, the new operator is going to do that. No. Nope. So, so this is this is not working. The new operator doesn't understand alignment, apparently. So it understands the size, but it doesn't understand the alignment. Okay. Yes. Uh, there is the comment was that in seventeen there's going to be a proposal that over-aligned storage should fix that. So that's interesting because the next thing I tried was using aligned storage because that's the C plus plus eleven way to do it, and then. We already heard about uh, um, aligned storage in, in Michal's talk. It was mentioned. So aligned storage is um, is a is a just a thing that gives you like any kind of alignment requirement, and then aligned storage defines a type inside, and that type is a type of whatever alignment requirement you specify if the platform supports that. Uh, and then there's also aligned union, which is even better. You can give it. Uh, a list of types, and, and it's going to return a type that has the alignment requirement for you know any of them. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, but then all the examples are using that on the on the stack. All the examples that we've seen so far. So so how does it work on the heap? So so you would write it down like this is very crude. This is not very generic. I could clean this up, but this is just a very quick experiment. So I want this buffer, and um, I say okay, there's a line storage. I, it, I want it to be aligned by 32 uh, bytes, for example, and then um, I have like. 1024 divided by 32 of those things, and then this should be 1024 bytes. Uh, well, it turns out it doesn't work because of the same reason as before, new doesn't understand alignment requirements. Right? So it turned out after a lot of search that the C11 way of al allocating aligned memory is this. So you um, allocate a buffer which is not aligned because new can't do that. With you know some some space, and then you use std align, which if it's not aligned, shifts it to the right alignment. And then if you want to use that in real code, you probably have to put some RII thing around it so that it cleans it. So it's, it's very 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 messy. And um, I, that, I couldn't find a, a, another way in standard C++ to do this. And what what you know what everybody has been using is the platform specific stuff because every operating system has this. Like on Linux or Mac, there was like the alloc, which is just does what you want, or rather aligned alloc in this case. It's like it's like malloc, but just with another argument, which is the alignment, and that works. And then on Windows, you have another thing. And and, and I, I'm just wondering why we don't have anything, why you don't have this in the standard, uh, because we use it a lot, um, and it's so easy, and all the all the major platforms support it. So I don't know. The other thing that I would sort of expect is to check if a pointer is aligned. That would be also really cool. I mean, you can implement it really simple or a bit more sophisticated where you say, you know, the pointer, the alignment has to be power of two or whatever, but this is like really, really simple. It's like a couple lines of code. And then that would be really helpful to check if a pointer is aligned to have, to have something like that understand that as well. Unfortunately, no. Um, so um, last words on alignment. Um, so um, we have this um, sort of way how memory is aligned, and then we have um, cache lines, and then uh, the cache line is more like this. It's like eight words, and then the cache lines are also aligned, and then um, basically um, one cache line can be this part or the next one, but but not in between. And that is very funny. When a while ago I wanted to know whether this is the case, whether like a cache line. Uh, you know, it has to be aligned like that. And I was asking around and no one knew the answer. Um, but yeah. Um, so, so cache lines are aligned and that means that sometimes you want to align your object to these cache lines because, um, for example, if you have an object like this, like so, so this is like one instance and, and this is the next instance, 
then this would s the, the second one will straddle two different cache lines. So in, if you if you if you want to access this object, you have to actually access two two cache lines instead of one. And depending on your data structure, that may have a performance impact. So uh, you, you you would align that to cache lines um, using uh, you know the the technique uh, just just align as. Um, and another thing that would be really cool in this context is to, to, to because there is no platform independent way of um, getting the cache line size. Y obviously, you can get the cache line size, but you have to like run some command in the terminal in POSIX or. Yes? Oh, that's great. The comment was that CPSS 17 has a proposal. Uh, there's a proposal that it gives you, it can give you give you an estimate of the cache line size, which is great. So yeah, that would be cool. Um, so fault sharing. I'm, I'm actually going to skip that. So I have a benchmark here as well, but um, there's a video where Herb Sutter is doing that, and I couldn't possibly do it as well as he does. So I'm gonna gonna skip that. Um, also, we don't have that much time. Um, cache associativity, that's a very fun one. Um, but I'm going to skip that as well because it, it takes a little bit long to explain. Um, okay, let me jump to vectorization in SIMD because this is in audio and I think in uh, probably you know gaming and everywhere where you crunch a lot of floating point numbers, this is a very important topic. So um, just a very, very quick introduction. Uh, SIMD means single instruction multiple data. Uh, where basically you have a single instruction, like for example, uh, MALPS is a multiplication, and then this allows you to perform an application on these SIMD regist on, on, on these SIMD registers, and each of them can, depending on um, you know the flavor of SIMD, hold, for example, four floating point numbers or eight floating point numbers. Um, so basically, ideally, you get a four or eight times speed up because you can, for example, multiply four or eight numbers with one instruction in one cycle. So um, there are these different flavors. This is also a very s actually a simplified table. So there's SSE, which, is, which has been around for a while. There's AVX, there's AVX2, which um, widens, uh, widens the register uh, size to 32 bytes. There's AVX512, which doubles it yet again. And then on ARM, there's NEON, which gives you 16 bytes. And then basically, they give you these registers, and they give you um, you know, a set of instructions. And then there's many, many sub-levels where like more instructions have been added. For example, fuse multiply add to do like multiply and, and addition in one, in one instruction. And there's, there's, there's many, um, you know, sets of instructions that have been added over time. Um, so, so and, but at, at this level, this is, a, this is just a technology that basically the CPU, the people who build CPUs give you. Like here's, here's the hardware and then you get these registers and you get these these instructions to operate on them. But as a C++ developer, how, how do you interact with that? And, and there's, in principle, there's four, four ways to do that. So either you, you just let the auto vectorizer do its job. For example, on, on um, Clang or GCC, that would be minus 03, uh, like one of these optimization flags. And by default, it would assume, as far as I know, S SSE2. You can specify a higher level than uh, you know, the, the, the auto vectorizer would um, use these additional instructions perhaps, but then the behavior would be undefined on all the machines. And then you would just write your loop normally. Uh, the second option is to use the Zimd library. Juice has, um, Juice has a Zimd module uh, where we have uh, some float vector operations. There's boost Zimd, which, which does that. There's Veclip, there's other libraries. And there you typically would have some kind of you know, type that represents this the, uh, this uh, SIMD pack, and then you would, um, you know, for example, in this case, multiply it with a number, and then uh, the library would take care of calling the right um, instructions for you. Uh, the fourth way of doing that is writing the that yourself using, for example, SSE intrinsics. So the same operation, multiplying a vector with a float, would would look like that. For example, in SSE, there's other instructions for neon. And the, um, the last way is to write inline assembly. And um, basically, yeah, the, 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 the auto vectorizer is the simplest way of, of doing that because you don't have to do anything at all. Uh, it's also portable. 
SIMD library is a bit harder because you have to actually th like consciously use it in your algorithm, but it's also portable depending on the library supporting different platforms. As a C intrinsic is not portable and much harder to maintain and much much simpler uh, simpler to get wrong. And um, actually, you know, I've, I've uh, seen SSE intrinsics hand coded, and then if you actually let the optimizer uh, optimize it, then the code is actually faster. Uh, and inline assembly is is even more difficult to maintain and even more difficult to write. And probably you only get it right if you have done it for many many years. So I think um, also these last two are not really C plus plus. I think they're you know, they're very important in certain domains, so I, I say like there's valid use cases of doing that, but at, at least for, um, you know, most of what, what I do and I think other people in, in the audio domain do, basically you work with um, either the auto vectorizer or with the SIMD library. Um, so, um, you know, let's just, th just have a look at the auto vectorizer. So, um, so let's, let's um, you know, do this very, very simple example where, um, Basically, the, the the simplest audio um, simplest audio effect, where you just have a a level or like a gain knob. So you have like a signal, and then you make it louder or or less loud. And that would be um, that would be you just multiply a, you know an array of floats or a buffer of floats, which represents your signal with a constant factor. So that's this very very simple loop, uh, you know, which everyone everyone can can write. And then um, you um, apply the optimizer, and um, let's see what it does. Let's try it with Clam. And um, this is the um, disassembly. So if, if I run it with minus s, then I get, I get this assembler code. So this is what Clang generates from this very, very, very simple loop. And um, yeah, I'm not very good at assembler, so this looks quite messy. But you can, you can see sort of like a rough structure. So there is. Um, the green ones are um, basically you you move the um, your your you know, four floats and then the um, in 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 one of these SSE registers and then you do the multiplication and then you move it back um, and then here you do it um, two registers at a time and then there you do it four registers at a time and then there is like uh, a tail where the blue one is is another loop where uh, you do it without, uh, it, it does it without parallelization. So it's just a single, more or less S, like a single, single float multiplication. And then there's some, some jumps in between them. Uh, so basically what happens here is that um, uh, the compiler has determined that probably, it doesn't know the size, right? So it has determined that probably the most efficient way of looping through this is uh, going 16 floats at a time per, per loop. So this is like the, the big one, but then if you have a remainder which is um, less than 16, but, but bigger than eight, then you do the one which takes eight and it does that first. And then if you have a remainder which is less than eight, then it does the single, single float. So basically, if you have a, a buffer, it would first do um, four floats times two like this, then it would enter the main loop, so it would do eight and again eight and then it would um, reset the like, move forward into the buffer do again 16 at a time and so on and so on and then at the end it would do this little tail and um, I think this is not not obvious to, to like always like what the compiler decides and how it works is that basically the compiler takes all the information that it has and then it has like a cost function where it tries to estimate know what what kind of what level of loop unrolling would be probably faster and then it, it tries to find like the best compromise it can it can reach um, for example if we now um, let the compiler know the size at compile time yeah so I'm just going to make the size a template argument and then because I compile it into an object file I'm going to explicitly instantiate the template yeah so template bracket bracket is the specialization syntax and template without the brackets is I explicitly want the compiler to generate this to instantiate this, this template and generate code for it. Um, so then the compiler sees the size is big and it's a power of two. So I'm just going to do the, this, this one big loop with the 16 ones at a time that I determined are probably the fastest. Um, now, if we, um, 
Let's do the same thing, but then make a small size, like 128 floats. And then if you look at the same thing, you see that now the compiler actually unrolls the whole loop. Um, so it thinks now it's more efficient. So basically you create a bigger binary, which um, can have a performance impact. But then on the other hand, you just, you just you know, compute all the elements in a row. You don't have any checks anymore. You don't have any jumps anymore. You don't have any counters anymore. So probably this is more important, like, like this is a bigger performance benefit in this case. So this, the compiler just decides all that stuff for you based on some heuristics. So, so th th that's what's going on there. Uh, and if you, for example, if you do the same with GCC, uh, we see that GCC does something else. GCC has also uh, a main loop, the green one, where it uses SSE registers. Um, but here the difference is that it uses move apps to, to get the four floats at a time in, into, the, into the SSE register, which is an aligned SSE move. Uh, and Clang was using an unaligned move. So it, it, it uses, the, it, 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 it zimbifies the part of your buffer that is aligned with 16 bytes. And then it has, uh, depending on, so there's like zero, one, two, or three elements left at either end depending on you know, where your buffer is, and then it's just doing that in, in single steps, the, the blue stuff. So um, basically, Clang, Clang uses unaligned moves into assembly registers, and GCC uses aligned moves into assembly registers. And I was looking at this, this, um, this assembly output, and I was asking a few other experienced audio people, and I, um, I was just curious, you know, what, what's the difference? And then I heard, very different opinions. People, you know, very experienced people said, oh, oh, like the, the, the buffer has to always be aligned. Like if, if, if the buffer is not aligned, then it, you're gonna have severe performance penalties and it's gonna crash, it's not gonna work. So you always want this buffer to be aligned. So you always want to use the aligned moves. And then someone else said, yeah, well, on, on modern architectures, actually the, the unaligned move is, is just as fast. So again, I, I benchmarked it. Um, and the way I did it is um, I took the next, next easiest audio effect, which is multiply add. So you have two buffers, and then you multiply one with a factor, and then you add them together, uh, which is used a lot in mixing, for example. That's basically a basic mixing operation audio, or in image processing, that would be like blending. So, so you get two buffers and a factor, and you say buffer one equals buffer one plus factor times buffer two. So that's a, another very, very basic operation. Then I, I just implemented this in, in um, you know, the very, very simple, um, very, very simple SSE intrinsics using the unaligned move or the aligned move. And then I actually did the same with the ARM intrinsics as well. And then down there, there was, there was a loop. Uh, and the numbers are chosen in such a way that uh, even if you run the loop a lot of times, there's always going to be more or less reasonably sized floats in there, so it's not going to like create infinity or something. Um, and if you, if you run that, you, you find this. So the red line is um, a line move of aligned data, which is what, what GCC does. And then the blue is unaligned move of aligned data, and the green is unaligned move of unaligned data. And the yellow one is if you just disable the vectorizer altogether. Uh, it's missing on the iPhone because I couldn't quite figure out in Xcode if you compile for iPhone how to disable the, the auto vectorizer without disabling any of the other optimizations. So like it wouldn't take the, the Clang compiler flag that I was familiar with. But, um, so, but anyway, um, it turns out that on, on modern Intel processors, um, basically the unaligned move is for free. It's the same as the aligned move if the data is aligned and then if the data is unaligned, you suffer a little bit of a penalty. But then on older Intel, on older Intel uh, CPUs, actually an unaligned move into an SSE register is very, very, very expensive. And it's actually more expensive than the, the actual SIMD instruction. So um, basically, um, you would be, basically your program would be bound by the memory access into the unaligned memory. Um, and sort of you wouldn't get any of the speed up at all anymore. Actually, you would be slower. So, um, and, then, and then the same thing, I guess, on the iPhone. Uh, the Android phone, f 
for some reason um, handles underlined data in this scenario where they're underlined with the SIMD, sim like neon neon size. So so uh, it, it really depends highly depends on the architecture and. Uh, if you go in these, for example, ARM sort of instruction manuals, you, you get some information there, but uh, as always, the only way to actually make sure is measure it on the platforms where you want to deploy it. And, yes? So just to check, uh, your, uh, not the, the numbers here have been normalized for each architecture. Yeah, okay. exactly, because otherwise the bars would be very different. So obviously, like, uh, the, the older... PC is like slower than the newer Mac, but then I just normalize it to sort of highlight if if one is aligned data and aligned access, like how much slower is it if you if you have an unaligned move into an SSE? Just one of the things that could be more at play here is how fast the multipliers can occur versus the memory system. Mm. Sort of like how how well can you feed the beast? Okay, so the if, yeah, if you have like mm. huge amounts of multipliers. So basically the comment was that it may be bound by the throughput of the data rather than the cost of the underlying move. And that uh, we would come up, have to come up with a better benchmark for this, I guess. Uh, but the whole point of this was actually, um, you know, if you, if you can align your, your buffers, um, then you don't have a problem. So, so basically here GCC and Clang are sort of going like a, with a compromise. Like uh, GCC is saying, okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do underlying moves. Um, but then it's gonna it's gonna work uh, if the data is unaligned. Whereas Clang says, uh, well, oh, actually the other way around. Um, Cl Clang does that. Whereas GCC says, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna not take the risk of the performance penalty, but then I'm gonna you know have a bit more overhead because I have to be aligned. Uh, and and um, here's an example for an algorithm that where. You know this, this this wouldn't work. Like your, your buffer has to be always aligned, because you you have to ha do underlying reads. So this is this is something that um, this is called convolution, and I think um, it's it's very common in different areas. And in audio, typically what you have is so it's in one D. In, in audio, you typically have like a long buffer, which is the green one, and you have a convolution kernel. For example, in audio, you use that to implement reverb and and other effects. And um, basically, um, what you do is you have a kernel which you can even is particularly pre-allocated and constant, and then you have your your data, and then you multiply the kernel with the with with the position in the audio stream, and then you you accumulate that into another buffer, and then you shift the kernel by one by one sample, and then you do that again, and then you shift the kernel by one sample, and then you do that again, and you keep accumulating. Yeah, so, so you're doing like multiple ads there, and you, you keep accumulating that. And because um, so basically, this is this is a very simple version of basically the loop that you would be running. And you can see that you know no matter how you go about this, if you do it this way, most memory accesses will be unaligned. So if you're on one of these systems where unaligned, un the unaligned moved into, into the uh, SSE register is is very costly, then this is going to be very um, expensive. And um, basically, the way we solve this, for example, in Juice, is that we pre-allocate four kernels. Um, you know, if in, in case your SSE width is, is four, uh, then we just allocate four kernels, each shifted by one, and they're all aligned. And then you just move them in groups by of four, and then and then sort of you have aligned access again. And then this, so this is how the Juice convolution kernel works, and this performs very well on on all platforms. Um, it could perform a little bit better though because um, even, if the, even if the memory access is aligned, the compiler doesn't know that. So the compiler will still be checking. So for example, GCC will still be checking if the pointer is aligned or not. And Clang will still use the unaligned move even if the data is aligned. And on, on some platforms, this, this is also more expensive. So Actually, what, 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 what you really want to do here is, in this multiply, 
uh, you have a pointer to the buffer, for example, and you want to tell the compiler that this pointer is aligned. Yeah? And then you, ha you, you, you want a way to tell the compiler, you can assume that this pointer is aligned. Don't, don't check for that, and you can use the aligned um, you can use the aligned move and everything. And then that would generate the, the ideal code for this. And I think GCC at some point had some kind of pragma to do that, but yes? Built in assume aligned. Right. So GCC and oh, cool. Well, great. Nobody of us knew that. Oh, that's great. So the comment was that there is a, what's, how's it called? Underscore, underscore, built-in, underscore, assume, underscore, aligned, which is the way to do that. Okay, cool. Um, yes? Yeah. Okay. Okay, several people were Googling me for this, and we didn't find it. So I think, I think this, is, this brings me back to the beginning of the talk, uh, basically, because this kind of stuff, I guess it's documented somewhere but it's not easy to find. Like, if you have a problem with the C++ class, you know, you, you know where to look for it. You, you look in, in, in some books, or you look at CPP ref, or uh, like in the last case, you just look into the standard, and then you can always find, you know, this member function of this standard library class, what does it exactly do? But then with this kind of, with this kind of stuff, I, I think it's, it's, it's much harder to get the information, actually. So, um, it would be great if you could have more of this stuff sort of in a, in a, in a platform independent way. Um, I mean, what I would we really want to, to be able to write is something like that. Uh, I, would, I would be able to write like, I don't know, I have like a lined pointer to T, which is not aligned with the alignment requirement of T, but with the whatever alignment requirement I choose. And then I just basically assume, so like a, an invariant of that class is that this pointer it's just aligned like that, and then compiler, you know, renders could implement. Uh, they actually do with you know their their um, their intrinsics um, that the compiler can just assume it's aligned and then optimize it better. But then it would be great for this kind of stuff to have like a more platform independent things because this, uh, you know, many many audio people, for example, use this kind of stuff, and I'm not sure how it is in the gaming industry or in the financial industry or in other you know heavy DSP based areas, but. Now, this is just one example of maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 different things that are all compiler specific, but the concept is very generic. And it would be you know, great to have more of that kind of stuff in C++. So you're write papers? Yeah, write papers. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, I have a long list of these things. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I will. Um, so um, at this point, when you are at this point, then you have to use the SIMD library or write your own intrinsics because then you can do that with intrinsics that kind of stuff and at this point how much time do we have left so at this point i actually originally wanted to um talk about the simbi library that's built into juice uh yes just one comment that you made is that yeah Yeah, for example, so the comment was, it's not necessarily true that you can finish multiple multiplications in one cycle, and how many cycles it takes depends on the architecture. And I, I've seen that a lot. Like when I was exploring all these different, uh, basically when, um, so, so my point was that in Juice we have, we have a Cindy library that does all that stuff for you. And then basically if you want to do something like that, you have to familiarize yourself with all these things. And one thing I, for example, found is that for example, on this machine, I can compile it with AVX1, and then I get these other instructions, which are AVX. So I tried, I tried all that stuff. So I had, I compiled, you know, the same kind of benchmarks with AVX, and then I had eight, eight floats at a time instead of four, and then I was like, yeah, this is going to be, and it was actually one instruction also, like in the assembly, and then I, I thought, okay, that's going to run two times faster, and then it, it ran at the same speed, and then I was like, why is that? And then I was looking in the, I was trying to find some kind of documentation, and then somewhere I found, well, yeah, on this type of processor, actually, one, one of these AVX instructions takes two cycles instead of one. So it's actually the same speed. Yeah, so um, yeah, many times, like, the computer architectures will have SIMD instruction 
compatibility did not sim the instruction mm. uh, So the, the comment was that a lot of the time, uh, the, comp the computer will sort of be able to execute the instructions, but it will actually not, it will actually probably fall back to some old instructions, it will be just compatible with the interface. So it will be compatible with the, um, you know, the, um, how is it called, the in instruction, like the machine level instruction. And I think how they do it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sometimes what they do is they actually implement compatibility for the instruction on the CPU level in advance. They didn't actually implement the, the better SIMD version yet, but they just implement a compatibility for, for, for the instruction, and then they add the actual functionality later that it's actually going to be faster in like some newer generation. Um, so, um, yeah, I saw the same with multiply, fused multiply add, for example, which if you, if you enable um, OFAST or like fast math, then the optimizer can assume uh, it doesn't have to keep all the IEEE um, rounding rules so it can do more optimizations. And then, for example, it replaces a multiply and add that we saw earlier, it replaces it with one fused multiply add instruction. But then again, on this particular processor here, this doesn't run faster. On, on another machine, probably it would. So that is, this whole stuff is like really, really platform, platform dependent. Um, yes? Um, so the comment was that the Intel compiler will um, give you gives you a lot of information about what it vectorizes and when and how and um, when not and what it assumes the performance will be. And I think Clang at least does the same, or maybe not to that extent. But y y Clang can also give you all these diagnostics, like when does it? Did you can actually control a lot of it. Like you can you can tell it like like how to unroll, or when to unroll loops, and then this kind of stuff. And then with vectorization, it will also tell you, you know, whether it succeeded or not. So this is, I don't know if you see, but in Clang, this is also available. Yeah. Yes? The, the remark system is currently being implemented. So it's, it's like not quite there yet, but it's... Mm. Going, yeah. Okay, so the, the comment was that the remark system on Clang is not quite there yet, but it's going to be finished. Oh. So, um, I'd like to talk about Juice's SIMD library, which we also call the DSP module. Um, unfortunately, so there's like a lot of cool stuff going on there that you know wraps all that away, and we do like expression templates, and we have a, we, what we really want to do is a thing where, you know, um, it compiles like. The, the problem is that if you compile for a higher level of SSE, then on a lower machine it will crash, but then sort of we want to do like a thing where it sort of compiles your DSP kernel several times and then you know dynamically loads the right one depending on, on your machine. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do, but the, the problem is that when, when I um, started doing these slides, I just realized talking about the, this is actually the exciting stuff, but talking about the, um, you know, what we do, what we do in Juice is, is like a whole other talk. It's like a whole, a whole big, big talk. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this next time when I'm at a, at a conference. <laughs> um, so OK, we have 15 minutes left. So either I have a few slides about um, branch prediction and denormals. So we could either do them or one of them. Or we could, if, if you guys have questions or want to discuss something, we can do that instead. The denormals, OK. Let me jump to the denormals. Uh, let me find my mouse cursor. So, um, denormals. Oh, sorry, lost here. OK, so I have some stuff on branch prediction, uh, which uh, I'm going to skip. I have a few interesting benchmarks there, more similar output. Then some stuff on virtual functions as well. All right, denormals. Let's crunch some floating point numbers. So here's a benchmark where it's again one of these super minimal, super naive sort of like things where you just have a loop and you, 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 uh, 
you multiply, you repeatedly multiply a float with some kind of factor, and um, this, is, this is chosen in such a way that, and th then you accumulate it into a sum, and then this is chosen in such a way that the sum will be sort of like a reasonable number. Like if x is, is 1, for example, then the sum will be something, maybe 2 or 3, but like not 10 to the, to the 30th or something. Um, so it's designed in, in, in this way, these, these numbers here. Um, and now what we're going to do, we're going to put, um, so, so this is simple, right? Okay, now the only thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, give it different floating point numbers. And um, I, I had to, you're doing this with an argument, and because otherwise if I just would write an expression there, maybe the optimizer would do something. So we just pass a number in. And um, here are the numbers. The, the, the five different numbers. Uh, and um, we know from Sean, Sean Perrin's keynote that um, the second one is uh, the second one is uh, in, uh, inf and the third one is um, none. On, yeah, actually where this came from is um, there was a, so I was doing all these benchmarks and like a lot more that I d didn't show. And then um, a colleague of mine just um, saw what I was doing. Like I had like loops of floating point numbers and then uh, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, if you do that kind of thing, you should try um, NaN and INF. And, you know, processors have a lot of problems with, with NANs and INF. So you will, you will see that if you have, like, a NaN in your loop and you're going to keep, then, then everything is going to slow down. And I was like, oh, okay, um, you know, I, I trust you, like, but I, I'm not sure. Like, I, that's this kind of thing that I want to see for myself. Um, so... So I tried it with one, with infinity, with none, with minus zero, which is also one of the special other special numbers um, you mentioned, and then with a with a very very small number. Okay, now let's take guesses. Uh, sort of, if you say the one, like the one, the, the first one is the boring case where the result would be like three or something. Yeah, so there's not going to be any any weird numbers in there. Um, so if you take this as like one, this is like the 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 um, unit of how long this loop takes. Uh, how long do you think the other four will take? What's your hardware and what's your <laughs> Right, so it's this, um, this computer, it's Clang, it's without fast math, but it's with O3, uh, and I didn't do anything else. It's lib C++ and C++11. But you didn't change the C No. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you can you can you can tweak all that behavior, right? There is like even, w yeah, we can come to that. But like, if just out of the box, which is actually what most people do. I mean, that that's the thing. Like, if, for example, you know, you you um, you're writing an audio app, you download Juice, for example, you choose Juice as your framework, you you create a new project, you export it to Xcode, you compile it, and you start developing, and and the thing is that you know s some people know everything about this topic but i would argue that like 99.9 percent .9 maybe not in this room but like out there <laughs> i mean i'm sure that there's many people here who know exactly what's going on but out there many experienced people don't know what's going on um so th this is why i just wanted to, to try that for myself uh okay so so you you you, you guys all know what's going on okay cool so, so, so who thinks the second one will be slower than the first one? Okay, so it's like the default settings, yes? Um, so who thinks the, uh, the non, the third one, will be slower? All right. Who thinks the minus zero will be slower? Okay. And who thinks the, uh, the last one will be slower? Okay. So people obviously know what the normals are. Um, so the last one, on, on this normal Mac with normal Xcode settings, um, release build. Who thinks it's going to be more than two times slower, the, the last one, than the first one? <laughs> OK, it's, it's out, like. The cur current max, the current out of the box max. Uh, I7, uh, I can give you the details. I'd 
I mean, it obviously depends a lot on the hardware, but it's just, um, you know, to get a feeling of like how much it could be on a particular machine that a lot of people have. So, who thinks it's going to be slower than two times that, that slow? Okay, yeah, slower than, than five times that slow. So, if the first loop takes one second, the, the last loop will take more than five seconds? Okay. More than 10 seconds, so more than 10 times slower. Mm. Okay, um, so it's <laughs> 26 times slower. <laughs> And all the others are equal. Um, yeah, and we can repeat this benchmark on other laptops if you like. Um, so um, yeah, the normals. Um, so basically, yeah, I mean, IEEE is something that everyone knows, but not everyone knows exactly how, 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 how this part works. So basically, if the exponent is um, all ones, then it's one of the special numbers. It's either plus or minus infinity, or it's one of the nones. If the exp exponent is not all ones and not all zeros, this is the normal float case, where you have like a sign bit, an exponent, and then a mantissa with an implied one dot, right? So that's the, the usual thing, how, how floats work. But then if the exponent is zero, basically if all zero, it's, you have a zero, that's also fine. If you have one and then all zeros, you have the negative zero thing. And then the last case is if, um, if um, the exponent, oh yeah, and I should say that the, in the normal case, the, the exponent has this, this kind of bias where like I think the middle value represents exponent zero. But then the interesting case is where the exponent is all zeros, um, but then there is some stuff in the fraction. And then actually what happens is that you already reached uh, the last, the, the, the smallest possible exponent, but then to, to represent numbers that are even smaller than that, um, so um, then what you do is sort of you start, you don't assume anymore that there's like a one dot here, but actually you assume that, you know, here's a zero and then you, you move the, so you start losing, you start losing um, digits. So the number is getting smaller, but you're getting less precision because you don't, you can't use the exponent anymore. So you just get it's starting to behave like a fixed point, floating point. And um, apparently, ha some hardware is really, really terrible at, at doing that. And I don't know the details of how that works, but it's uh, yeah, apparently, like the way the processor does does floating point numbers, like these two normals, they sort of break the way it's implemented in the hardware, I guess. So it has to do some extra work to to get the math right. All right, the comment was that it typically goes into microcode, so it's actually not done in the... So it's actually, I mean, typically if you, if you do floating point stuff, most of the time if you compile it for release, it's all going to be done in these uh, SSE registers. So I'm guessing that this is then not, not the case anymore. So anyway, something completely different happens. And um, uh, the standard gives you this, where... Oh, and actually, yeah, uh, some... some, some um, some uh, computers don't have that, right? So or some architectures don't, don't have these denormals, they don't support them. So what the standard actually gives you is you can ask a float or a double, what's the minimum, okay, what's the minimum uh, number that you can represent? And that means what's the minimum number you can represent with the normal, like one dot something representation. But then there's this other one, denormin, and this represents like what, what is the lowest denormal, which is basically zero, 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 and then the mantissa is zero, 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 one. Um, and you see that that's much smaller. So like you can, all the numbers in between can represent it as denormals. And then there's also like a flag whether this architecture has denormals or not. So uh, you can sort of like ask whether this case can occur, uh, but then, many architectures allow you to um, set like a flag in the CPU to say, okay, I don't want this 26 times uh, slowdown. I mean, I'm gonna just flush all the normals to zero. So whenever the, the, the CPU encounters a denormal, it will just set it to zero, which because if its numbers are so small, um, probably, so it's probably is not gonna affect your numerical result. But then the problem again, as with all this stuff really is that to flush the normals, there's nothing in the standard for that. And that's different on every compiler. And for example, this, 
I think it's the Visual Studio one. I don't actually even remember. Uh, the, the, there's like this this intrinsic that you, you can you can set this like CPU register thing flag that it flushes all the genomes to zero, and then you can get rid, get rid of that. And then you can you can set it back. So um, you would take this thing on this platform, put it probably into some kind of Air AI thing. Um, oh, I think by, by the way there was this proposal by I think Peter Sommerlad with the scope exit thing that would be really cool for this kind of stuff you just have like a little scoped put that into like a scope thing so why would you never say that? Uh, because for example I, I'm just, I just can speak of like music music use cases you, you are like in an audio plugin where you have like your DSP going but then you run typically in a in a, in a host which uh, has like other plugins you have like multi tracks and you don't want to st set change the state for like all the others all the other plugins. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, that, that's the, that's, that's my point. Okay, I don't have a slide on that. But that actually occurs. If if you if you um, at least in DSP, like I don't know, is, is Tobias here? No, we were talking about this. So basically. Um, you like I, I, I encountered this, like you, you have this in, in certain DSP algorithms, if you, probably because you didn't design the algorithm right, yeah? Uh, and then sort of you have some weird numerical instability and then you keep accumulating the normals. And then this will bring, I mean it will not bring like, your whole thing to a grinding halt because it's just a small part of your algorithm, but you can see it. So what you would see is you would see CPU, you would actually see CPU peaks and this actually does happen. Yeah. And Yeah. It does mm. Has anyone actually proven the math that they're doing? So, okay. So basically, basically the comment was that the normals don't matter, and I, I, I agree. Like as far as I know, they don't. But most people, uh, you know, outside of you know conferences like this, they're not aware of them. So. Um, so, so actually, one one last comment. So actually, actually, this this happened, yeah, in in, in, in real in real code that you would see CPU spikes, and then you would do this, yeah, fine, and then the next thing that would turn out is that this is per thread actually, and then um, basically you you ship the app. I mean that did not happen, but like hypothetically, like you ship you you, you ship the app and then someone. Uh, you know, some of them, okay, maybe you don't ship it, but like some of them have, a, have like a multi-core mode and then that's the thing that actually happened that if you turn, if you turn, turn on the, the, the multi-core mode then you get these spikes again. And so, so, so this kind of thing is not only, uh, so controlling this kind of stuff is not only specific to compilers, but then it's also like per thread and, and this is again one of these things that are, I, I don't know, I find them really uncomfortable to work with because this is kind of thing that you just have to know and at some point after like working in the industry for 10 years, you happen to have heard about this thing and there's like hundreds of these things. So why don't we put this kind of thing in the, in the standard? Like flushing the normals to zero. Like, like a simple, simple thing that's like the same on all platforms that support the normals in the first place. Mm. Okay, so, so, so far removed from what the standard says. So that's why it's not supported. And hardware supports it at very easily. Some hardware just doesn't have it. Some mm. hardware, um, if you compile, if you compile with honors, that's what you do. That's a fast map. And alarm uh, on 7, mm. that disabled that provision because Neon is on that problem. But that's a PFP. Okay, so. So the comment was that C++ is not aware of IEEE or it doesn't say that you should support it, so it, it, shouldn't, it, it doesn't do this kind of like specific thing. But then, I mean, it does have a check whether you have them, right? Right, that's a half-assed thing. So, so, I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. Why do we have this? But we, it's, it's exactly like with, um, what was the other thing where sort of 
with the with the with the alignment thing that you you have like aligned storage, but you have don't have a way to check whether a pointer is aligned. Right. This kind of stuff. It's like and there's like so many examples of this. So write papers. <laughs> um, right. Okay. Cool. Um, I think we're out of time. So um, yeah, I have some more stuff here, but it has to wait until another time. Thank you.